Hey, I'm Zanzi and welcome to Farmers Inside Track, episode 163. I'm your host, Dawn Numdu. Now, at Food from Zanzi, we got to know Daniel and Devin De Sosa as the farming brothers who started farming without land. In today's episode, we pick their brains about why their business model works and how innovative ideas and being more focused on running your farm as a business is key. Welcome to Farmers Inside Track. For the first time, I actually have Daniel De Sosa and his brother Devin De Sosa in the same room. I've met so many people the past two days that I've interacted with, you know, via social media and WhatsApp. And to finally have you guys here is absolutely amazing. So welcome. For people who might not know about what you do, where did it all start? What started is a concept back in 2016, where basically at the end of my studies as a creative, I obviously studied at Vegas School, a brand leadership, I stumbled across a concept called spin farming. And essentially in Europe and the Western world, that basically means it's an abbreviation for small plot intensive. And it kind of sparked my interest in looking at my own backyard as a productive space to produce enough food for my own household. A couple of years later, it turned into a little business. It's still a concept phase where I was producing enough leafy greens in a neighbor's backyard who was actually next door to us. At the time, he ended up leasing the land to us for fresh produce as payment at the end of every month instead of actually paying him cash. So it was an expense to him. His lawn was basically a burden. And instead of him having grass, we were essentially growing veg and supplying all the restaurants in the area with what we were doing at the time. Over the next couple of years, developed into where it is now. Unfortunately, last year where we were down in Kazan, we were hit with hefty riots big disturbance to all the businesses down there. So we had to pivot and ended up going into consulting. At the moment now, the past year, we've been training about 20 ECDs in the Hammersdale region for a, a corporate partner of ours. We've been doing that for about a year now, and now into the new year, we'll be doing a lot more. So that's basically where we're at. We have a team of three people. Devin, my brother, obviously joined me at the beginning of this two years ago, he joined me, and uh, we've not looked back. I think it's such an interesting way to look at, you know, the agricultural sector. You've really come and disrupted it in a way, especially in terms of how you think about how you operate. What do you think happens in the next five to 10 years in terms of the agricultural space? I think we've spoken a lot about how people source finance, what institutions should be thinking about. But what does the future farmer actually look like? Also incorporating what you do. Devin, would you like to take this one? So what I've seen is that in a good way, bringing all the stakeholders together, I think the whole landscape is going to change dramatically is when they eventually realize, or hopefully by our shifting and shaping it, will help realize that we stop each of these entities, these stakeholders working in silos. They start working together collectively and offer their offerings as a bucket to the farmers. So we, instead of offering a grant and offering a gap and offering funding and offering equipment, etc., and even the, the way they approach farmers, they, they approach them from the aspect of, okay, cool, you're growing a small farm, we want to help you upscale. Problem is, their foundations aren't correct. They haven't got a groundwork. There isn't enough business mindset in an agricultural space. If they start teaching farmers a business side to them first, by instead of forecasting your crops, you're forecasting your budget. And instead of doing plant production, you do budgeting and instead of looking at access to market you look at branding your products so it mirror images the business aspect of marketing branding compliance once you run it as a business you know there is a need to be compliant you know there is a need for accounting you know there is a need for branding and compliance and your SARS and your PTYs etc so I think once we realize that and a farmer becomes a lot more educated in the business aspect they'll be a lot more sustainable then it'll be easier to create funding opportunities for them and grow them the second aspect is, I think, is you don't have to be a large commercial farmer to be successful. You can be a small to medium enterprise, but if you run efficiently, you can be profitable and you can grow in multiple sites. You don't have to be such as a large scale. And that comes with its own challenges and problems of growing. And the fact is that we're offering gap, and we're offering all these traceability, etc. But by the time they, you approach the farmer, the farmer's already planted the crops with the wrong soil, with the wrong seeds. They're going to have to start again. Whereas if you educated them before they grew it, these issues and these problems, we wouldn't even have the problems we have now. The landscape's going to change for the farmer before the farmer's going to change. Yeah, definitely. Words that I constantly hear now in my conversations with people is precision, smart farming, not farming for now, but farming for the next 10 to 20 years. What do you think are the type of steps that farmers can practically put in place from day one? Or even just that turnover from how my grandfather probably taught me how to farm. And then now I'm listening to these conversations. I'm sitting here and thinking, okay, so how do I actually start? 
Well, there's two points. I'll, I'll hand over to Daniel for the first. The first point I would say is a majority of the small subsistence and starting farmers are either they fell into it based on their heritage or their passing down of their farms. They've got the skill necessary that that farm was ultimately to assist them with a feeding scheme, whatever it may be at home. And it's grown and grown and grown. But the problem is they haven't looked at it as a business to start with. If they start with doing that and work out their structures, a lot of them are cooperatives. And I'm all for a cooperative purposes to share, etc. But majority of the time, it's unequal. A lot of the farmers work harder than the others. And there's disputes. And there's problems with ownership and decision making and application forms, etc. So if you get your groundwork properly and your infrastructure correct from the start, I think business-wise, you'll be successful. In terms of farming-wise, Daniel can maybe elaborate a little more. I think to add to that would be to say, I think a lack of exposure to evident business models that are able to be copied and repeated, you know, the copy-paste mentality. I think the copy-paste mentality is a great philosophy to live by, but something that I remember being told, nothing's original. That's a, a very lenient a concept to lean on because it allows you the ability to look at somebody else's ideas, business model, their thinking, their approach, their strategy, pretty much the whole backbone of what makes them do what they do and tick and be able to replicate it and then on top of that, customize it to yourself, whatever the necessary market needs are. And I think on top of that as well is what makes you you is what you should look at first. So the uniqueness behind the reason why you do what you do is actually where everything stems from, is the purpose, the reason why. I think that's definitely something that we had discussed in the panel that I was talking with is around businesses don't just run on profit, they run on purpose. Just as a last point, where is the farm nearby going in the next five to ten years? We've got some really exciting project that we work to, actually, that we've landed another big, massive client um, in the next coming months. But ultimately, for the family buy and Daniel Moore, even specifically because it's been his vision and his purpose and his dream, is to create an amazing project within the city, and that's going to be coming soon. And from my point is Daniel's always been very highly spoke of and your support and your structure to him as well, I really appreciate. So from my perspective, I say thank you. I want to use it friendship, not partnership, because you don't benefit financially from each other. You benefit from learnings to each other. So you're both friends and I love the synergies you guys have had. So he'll probably announce it on your platform first. Definitely. He'll give you that exclusivity. <laughs> There's a lot in the pipeline. We've got big dreams. We've got a big vision. If we can make it all happen, we are doing everything we can to do that. And it seems as though the world is giving us indications that everything might align and we'll share as we go, like we've always said. Thank you so much for joining me here once again on Farmers Inside Track. That is, of course, Daniel and Devin De Sosa, the farming brothers who started the farm nearby. You can, of course, read more about their journey on Food from Zanzi. That's www.foodformzanzi.co.za. From me, Dawn Numdu. Our producer, Megan van der Fendt, and the rest of the Food from Zanzi team have an awesome week. Bye for now. Life in South Africa can be a lot. I mean, scroll through Twitter for a minute and tell me I'm wrong. Thank God for South Africans though, right? We're inspiring, and even on the bad days, we fight back with a smile. That's why I love Food from Zanzi so much. They're not ashamed to celebrate the ordinary unsung heroes who work every day to put food on our nation's tables. Go to foodformzanzi.co.za and never miss an inspiring story.